some of it's repeated. I'm going to try to give an overview, um, but get to recent and unpublished work. So, um, in the late 1990s with Craig Jensen and Bill Koska, um, we discovered that these pincer iridium complexes could catalyze alkane dehydrogenation, uh, itself uh, a very challenging reaction, but perhaps best of all with selectivity at the terminal position. And so this kind of selective functionalization of alkanes was really one of the, had been one of the holy grails, as it were, of organometallic catalysis. So you can see here that at a very early time, the one octene is the major dehydrogenation product, uh, although isomerization to give the more stable olefins uh, kicks in. And for a long time, we were never able to get more than 100 millimolar or so, uh, or even 100 millimolar of alpha olefin. So a couple of points. First, um, you'll notice that we're not strictly, or I'm not strictly showing dehydrogenation here. It's a transfer of hydrogen from an alkane to an olefin. So you end up with an olefin and an alkane, and that might not seem too valuable. Um, but alkane dehydrogenation itself is a very endothermic reaction. And so this drives the reaction. Um, in terms of it being practical, this would be valuable with cheap olefin. Alan, maybe you can. Alan, you may have to just dismiss that screen. To be done by Arunan. Yes. That screen should be removed by Arunan. Yes. Is all in lost connection or? Yeah, I think so. <clears throat> we are seeing the screen, a screenshot. Yeah, screen shot is it. coming, but it's not moving. I think it's connects. I think it's the lost connection. Screen connects. is frozen. I think it's lost connection. Now it's actually live. I mean, I think. Okay. All right. I don't know what just happened. Sorry about that. I know it's coming. Yeah. Um, right. You can share your screen again, Alan. I think yeah, yeah. we lost your connection briefly. Could we all keep the videos off? Yeah. I think all of you keep your videos off except Alan, who can have the video on and share the screen. Okay. Um, can, yes, coming. okay. can you see? Can you see my screen now? Yeah. yeah yes. Please. All right. Um, so, uh, as I think I was saying. Um, so this alkane dehydrogenation itself is a very endothermic reaction. So we use a olefin typically to drive it. We can reflux off hydrogen. This is a difficult reaction. It goes slowly under those conditions. Isomerization is relatively fast. You don't get a buildup of alpha olefin. But as I was saying, we, we like to use convenient olefins like norbornene and t-butylethylene, which are expensive. Um, we figured it could always be practical uh, with things like ethylene and propylene. Uh, at some point, we were funded by Chevron, and they said that's all well and good, but we'd actually like to see real-world conditions. And a certain Akshay Kumar from Professor Samuelson's group uh, left at that challenge. And so they were interested in light alkanes and light olefins. And so pentane and ethylene or propylene at 200 degrees 
is experimentally challenging. But as I say, Akshay rose to that challenge. Uh, remarkably, doing this all in glass ampules. If anyone else is as brave as Akshay and willing to do this, please do it in very heavy walled ovens. Once in a while, these little ampules do explode. Anyway, as you can imagine, you take something like this to 200 degrees, it'll immediately boil off. Our pristine catalyst will splatter against the wall. And after cooling, looks something like this. I was not optimistic that that would work. In fact, it works. And even more surprising, it even seemed to give selectivity even higher than the selectivity that we obtain in solution. So for the first time, we were getting well over 100 millimolar of alpha olefin up to 500 millimolar. What we eventually figured out is that this heterogeneous catalyst um, is actually uh, obeys the same rate laws as the solution phase, but under these conditions with a relatively high concentration of acceptor versus the olefinic product and a very good acceptor in the gas phase. Using the same rate laws, we were able to show that this solid catalyst follows exactly the same rate laws as in solution. And so I really think that's a a very different way of looking at molecular catalysts as something potentially completely heterogeneous. So um, even so, the yields of olefin are still relatively low, or alpha olefin. And early on, we realized that um, we were probably never going to get high yield, high conversion of alpha olefin. Can we generate the olefin, effect the secondary reaction? Um, presumably, that'll require a second catalyst and use the olefin before it's isomerized. Uh, and so let me give you a little bit of background where I think we've had most success with that. Um, so. Demand for liquid fuels is or was still growing pre-pandemic. Uh, so things like diesel and jet fuel are going to remain liquid for a long time. The, those whereas gasoline cars will be replaced by electric vehicles. Um, hopefully, however, although we normally associate liquid fuels with conventional oil, that does not have to be the case. So we have alternatives to conventional oil, and in particular, if we could take carbon and renewable energy. So there's lots of alternatives to conventional oil. All of them have in common that they tend to lead to light out gains. And this need, this growing need for diesel and jet is specifically for heavy alkanes, hence the interest of Chevron in taking pentane to heavier species. So this presents a challenge. Can we rearrange alkane chain? And so our approach has been based on dehydrogenation. If this is hexane, for example, our catalyst removes hydrogen to generate hexene. In tandem with an olefin metathesis catalyst is the idea. And so this typically wants an acceptor. If the acceptor is the metathesized olefin, now the net reaction would be metathesis of an alkane. Now, this had been done. In fact, this is what inspired us with conventional heterogeneous catalysts, uh, but not giving you anything like the selectivity shown here. So can we do this with our highly selective molecular catalysts. <laughs> Excuse me. So shown here, um, we mix our pincer catalyst with a Schrock olefin metathesis catalyst. We have here hexane. Note that no hydrogen acceptor is used. And this sort of works like a charm, thanks to a very skilled postdoc, Ritu Ahuja, also, of course, from Professor Samuelson's group. 
So this was in collaboration, though, with the group of Maurice Brookhart at North Carolina. So we'll give them some credits. Um, so lots of different alkanes, all linear. So that was that was very nice. We can get uh, thousands of turnovers, and in part that's because we can recycle this um, by affixing substituents at the power position, which bind to solid supports, allowing us to recycle the, uh, the catalyst very nicely. So that, uh, I think, gives you uh, an idea of where we were for a long time. Everything based on these low-valent iridium-1 species. And a few years ago, our attention was caught by this report by Nishiyama, in which he found that this iridium-3 complex activated alkanes <laughs> excuse me, in a way to uh, similar to our pinsir iridium with selectivity at the terminal position. Um, he proposed that this was all going through iridium-3, and our computational collaborators actually provided support for this. So this really caught our attention because iridium-1 is fine as long as you're strictly in hydrocarbon land, um, but has a lot of limitations. In particular, once you introduce heteroatoms, they tend to bind and kill iridium-1. So that means if you want to do, say, dehydrogenation followed by hydration, well, if your catalyst can't tolerate water, you can't do that. If you want to dehydrogenate something that already has a functional group, the aliphatic group, the iridium-1 will tend to get killed by that. Or if you just want to activate the alkane and then do something like oxidation, carbonylation, those types of reagents will kill the iridium-1 catalyst, perhaps not iridium-3. And finally, a interesting aspect of the high oxidation state, if we're sticking with a single oxidation state, then it's not obvious there's anything special about iridium, and perhaps this could be transferable to other catalysts, other metals, even, even base metals. So, we began a collaboration with the group of Karen Goldberg and Kate Allen in the Goldberg group, does the Nishiyama reaction, and takes it to a higher temperature, or starts with that activated alkyl species. And at this high temperature, this then eliminates olefin, so octene in this case. Uh, the rate was actually slightly promoted by water, which is a big contrast with our low oxidation state species. So that really highlights that aspect. So can we incorporate this into a catalytic cycle? So here's the Nishiyama reaction, the alkane activation, the Kate Allen reaction, eliminating olefin at 200 degrees. Now we've done this heterolytic dehydrogenation. We have here a proton and a hydride. We could imagine inserting an olefin into this iridium H bond and then protonating that alkyl group. That would be a net transfer dehydrogenation. Or if you have a hydride and a proton, why not just combine them directly and we could hopefully do acceptorless dehydrogenation producing H2. So in fact, this catalyst does do acceptorless dehydrogenation. Not terribly good at it, but not so terrible. Um, now, based on what I just told you, you can imagine that this will be promoted by acid combining with the hydride intermediate. So we looked into that, but acids actually seem to inhibit the reaction. So a graduate student in my group, Yang Gao, looked at this in depth and figures if acids inhibit, maybe bases will promote the reaction. In the absence of any additive, he finds that we really get no transfer dehydrogenation, uh, even up to 200 degrees with either of the two intermediates I showed you on the last slide. But when he adds a base, sodium t-butoxide, now he gets a fairly respectable transfer dehydrogenation rates. 
So that seems promising, except I thought that what the base is doing is eliminating acetic acid, generating iridium-1, getting us into the same type of cycle we were essentially trying to avoid. But Yang was not so uh, easily defeated, looks into this in more depth. So the acetate hydride doesn't show any reaction with ethylene up to 200 degrees. He adds sodium t-butoxide and at room temperature, so we've gone down from 200 to room temperature, we get the product that I expected, elimination of acetic acid followed by coordination of ethylene, but that's minor. The major product is results from insertion of ethylene into the iridium H bond. So the sodium t-butoxide is just accelerating this by many orders of magnitude. This reaction that's obviously relevant to uh, dehydrogenation. But it's, it's not at all obvious how sodium t-butoxide is persuading the ethylene to insert into the iridium H bond. And Young had this crazy idea that it was acting not as a base, but as an acid. Or more precisely, the sodium was acting as a Lewis acid. So here's the reaction that I just showed you, the major product being ethylene insertion. He replaces the sodium T-butoxide with a non-coordinating anion, the BARF anion, and now a reaction that went remarkably at room temperature one hour is finished by the time he gets it into the NMR, and it's all the insertion product. So none of the acetic acid elimination product now that we don't have the base. So it's pretty clearly the sodium, not the T-butoxide that's doing the work here. Other Lewis acids are affected, uh, and this works for other olefins uh, as well. <laughs> So if sodium is what appears to be catalyzing the insertion of olefin into the iridium H bond to give an alkyl, catalysts are supposed to work in both directions. Can we do the reverse? This is the reaction Kate Allen had to go to 200 degrees in order to do. Now Yang is getting it at 55 degrees. Now this is reversible, so he seems to be getting uh, an equilibrium. Study and the lower the temperature, the more the equilibrium lies to the left. We trap the iridium hydride with olefin better than 14 with olefin. And now instead of 200 degrees, he's got to take it down to minus 15 degrees in order to, to measure the kinetics. So remarkable effect of sodium. So what appears to be happening, I'll show you calculations in a minute that support this, but what could really sodium do? It could bind to oxygen and help the acetate to dechelate, opening up a vacant coordination site, allowing olefin to come in or out. So we started thinking, what else could we do with that vacant coordination site? We have a sort of one-track mind, thinking in terms of CH activation. So you could imagine the hydride reacting with methane to give a methyl plus H2, that would be thermodynamically unfavorable. So we're catalytic chemists, we go where the thermodynamics take us. Um, and if you do the reverse reaction without any sodium barf, effectively zero with sodium barf. So once again, the sodium has a very large catalytic effect, although this is not quite as large only a couple of orders of magnitude compared with the insertion. So now we have both steps in, oh, I, sh I should mention, we can also see the CH activation directly through HD exchange. So now, um, sorry, um, calculations by Chang Zhang Guan support what I uh, just alluded to. The sodium opens up a vacant coordination site Hydrogen comes in if we go in that direction. Essentially, it does an oxidative addition, although this is not an energy minimum, it's a transition state, uh, and eliminating, in this case, methane. 
uh, or of course, as a catalysis, it could work in both directions. So we can catalyze with sodium both segments of an acceptorless dehydrogenation cycle. The sodium does promote the reaction, but what we find is that not as much as we had hoped. And we think there's one, or we thought there's one or two things going on. One is decomposition at these temperatures. Another is limited by the rate of expulsion of hydrogen. So to make it more resistant to decomposition, and also based on calculations by Shantanu Malakar, um, we made this trifluoromethyl substituted species. And indeed, this does seem to be a better catalyst. And really quite, quite remarkably good. Um, so we see here, we're, we're getting good rates of acceptorless dehydrogenation with four millimolar catalysts. We lower the catalyst concentration. We don't see much difference down to 0.25 millimolar. And so what this is telling us is independence on the concentration of catalyst is that we've basically maxed out the catalytic ability. And the best that a catalyst can do is approach equilibrium. More catalyst, better catalyst won't help you. At equilibrium, we have an extremely small concentration of hydrogen and Purging hydrogen out is a very tends to be a very slow process. And so that's what appears to be limiting the reaction rate, not the actual catalytic activity. So we could even we start seeing the loss of catalytic activity down to as low as 0.05 uh, millimolar. So we have two options now, or what I've shown you. One the hydrogen with an olefin. The other is to drive out hydrogen. Neither of these is, is ideal. They both have serious limitations. The sort of obvious thing is make use of this wonderfully cheap oxidant that nature has given us, uh, O2. Now, O2 uh, under catalytic with, with catalysts, and even with when you're making olefins at high temperature is going to give you unwanted reactions. But there's ways of separating the oxygen from the catalyst and the reaction that's been done on a very large scale, most notably perhaps the VACA process, where in effect we shuttle electrons and protons over to the oxygen. So can we do that with our alkane instead of making hydrogen? And if we're going to shuttle electrons and protons, perhaps we can do it through a fuel cell, actually get energy out of this, uh, ideally, although you wouldn't get too much. Um, or at the, so driven again by oxygen, but at the other half cell, or perhaps reduce, just reduce the protons to make, uh, generate hydrogen at the cathode. So we're interested in coupling proton-electron transfer uh, to do dehydrogenation. And Arun Sada has studied this using silver as the electron acceptor, t-butoxide as the proton acceptor. <laughs> so he finds that relatively rapidly, <laughs> electrons and a proton to essentially moving a hydride to give protonated species, and then much more slowly, t-butoxide removes the second proton that generates our iridium-1 catalytically active species. Doing this in the presence of cyclooctane regenerates the dihydride, and we get our olefin. So that describes a catalytic cycle, and in fact, we can, he can do this catalytically uh, and get a pretty high yield. So our sacrificial acceptor now is silver instead of olefin. That doesn't seem like much of an improvement, but the idea is really something that will shuttle electrons. Uh, silver, however, falls out of solution. So for something that stays in solution, a classic electron acceptor is ferrocinium, and this works 
quite nicely, although doesn't quite give uh, as many turnovers as he got with Silva. Uh, Arun did then something about as crazy as Yang's uh, idea, which was to use as the electron acceptor cobaltocinium. Now, most of us know that cobaltocene is a reducing agent, so cobaltocinium is not normally viewed as a electron acceptor, but sure enough, this works, even gives more turnovers than ferrocinium. Uh, we interpret this as being that the ferrocinium is over-oxidizing the species. So this really highlights how little electrochemical potential we need to drive this reaction. So makes it very promising in that context. <laughs> Excuse me. So um, finally, um, I'm going to describe a project which is sort of the confluence of the three general themes that I've mentioned are iridium-1 dehydrogenation, high oxidation state, and proton-coupled electron transfer. So a while ago, Tianzhou did some calculations looking for a better iridium-1 catalyst. He replaces the CH bond with a nitrogen, just very exploratory, calculates that it should not make much difference at all. However, again, this is all computational, if you protonate or alkylate this nitrogen, he calculates it should be a much better catalyst. So Akshay Kumar again, I think this was the last thing he did in my lab before unfortunately leaving, leaving Rutgers to take his position at IIT Guwahati. I think the last thing he did was this magical synthesis in which he makes this complex and got some preliminary results showing that indeed it was a dehydrogenation catalyst similar to the parent complex as predicted, but didn't get around to the alkylation protonation step. More recently, that's been picked up by Tariq Bhatti, who finds this is a very interesting species. Firstly, this nitrogen turns out to be extremely basic, far more than a pyridine, and we can interpret this in terms of this protonated species actually being a carbene or having significant carbene resonance form. So that's interesting, but what was really surprising was that the synthetic precursor, this hydrochloride, the parent complex is really quite stable, yet this was highly reactive towards oxygen. And looking into this further with oxygen or benzoquinone, what it ends up doing is a CH activation and the dehydrogenative carbon metal coupling with the hydrogen going over to benzoquinone or in the case of oxygen, presumably to give water. But this is really surprising. As I said, the parent complex is not oxygen sensitive. The nitrogen should make it more resistant to oxidation. But in fact, a simple one electron oxidant far more reactive with the nitrogen species. And again, we get this CH activation, which is really very intriguing because unfortunately here, <laughs> it's an intramolecular reaction. If, however, we know that under other conditions, this can go for alkanes instead of its own T-butyl groups. If that were to happen, we get this alkyl. We know this species would beta hydrogen eliminate to complete this cycle of exactly the type <clears throat> exactly the type that we are interested uh, in. So what's going on here? Calculations by Faraj Hassanine at American University at Beirut really shed light on this. So indeed, this is hard to oxidize, but it forms this zwitterionic or carbene form, which, as you might imagine, is much easier to oxidize giving this metallo radical. In fact, Tariq actually observes this unusual metallo radical species, which eventually also gets oxidized to give this cation. This cation then undergoes oxidative addition to give this iridium-5 species, which very readily loses a proton. So we're very excited about this interesting chemistry essentially to do dehydrogenation of alkanes, 
We just have to develop a derivative that doesn't have these R groups that'll undergo uh, cyclometallation. We think this also has potential in other respects as well. So with that, um, here's the people who did this, or actually this was our last um, pre-pandemic picture. Um, but so let me thank them, the people who funded it. But of course, most of all, let me thank Professor Samuelson uh, again for being just uh, a really inspirational human being and chemist, uh, as well as giving me, uh, sending to me three, three fantastic postdocs. Um, I mentioned Rito Ahuja and Akshay Kumar. Um, Raj Shekhar Ghosh um, worked on a different project. So we don't only do dehydrogenation, um, but all of them showed fantastic, fantastic training. Uh, and all of them shared their uh, admiration for you, Professor Samuels. So thank you. Um, thank you. How do I stop? Thank sharing? you, Professor Goldman, for the excellent talk. Now the lecture is open for discussion. If you have any query or questions. Yes, Professor Jagid there. Uh, uh, hello, Alan. Let hello, me just on How are you? <laughs> All right. Yeah. Good to see you. Uh, I enjoyed your talk very much. Yeah, uh, I have a couple of uh, short questions. Uh -oh. I think in um, in one of your uh, uh, computational studies, uh, you pointed out that methane evolution takes place. Right? You have yeah. a you yeah. have a methyl uh, plus H two reaction, uh, which results in methane evolution. So did you did you actually do any um, isotope uh, you know uh, incorporation uh, experimentally? Um, not with like, for example, CH3D. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Sorry. yeah. So, so, so we didn't do methane because you know methane. Uh, well, you know, it's 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 uh, it's a gas. It's going to be present in in small in small amounts. But but we did give we did see HD exchange with with alkane. So, um, I don't think we have any reason. In fact, the, key, the calculations indicate that methane is actually more reactive, which is which is often the case with, as you okay. know, transition metals. So. Right. Yeah. Uh, one more short question, Akhil, uh, if I may. Yeah, yeah. No problem. Yeah. Uh, so in the case of uh, the acetate uh, ethyl complex that you have, uh, did you ever observe uh, reductive elimination of ethyl acetate so that you generate the three coordinate species once again? Yeah. Um, no, we never did. Um, I never actually thought of looking for it. I, I, I think Young would have uh, w w would have noticed would have noticed that. Okay, I think we'll go to the next. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, Durga Pushat. Uh, uh, Professor Goldman, very uh, nice presentation. So I have a question on your uh, first chop, uh, the first topic, the transfer dehydrogenation. So what is the uh, driving force for this reaction? Because you have an alkane and you have an alkene and you you generate again another alkene and alkene, right? Yeah. So why the reaction is going in forward direction? Um, well, first of all, we tend to use things which probably make it very slightly thermodynamically favorable, but we don't have to. So think norbornene and t-butylethylene. But if you just think of, let's say, starting with octane to one hexene transfer, well, eventually you'll, you'll, you'll reach equilibrium. And so your concentration of alkane is about 10 molar. Um, and so there it's uh, presumably a thermoneutral equilibrium and you would just statistically essentially con you know consume the, the great majority of, of the acceptor at equilibrium uh, if you use a strain double bond uh, uh, 
uh, let's say, can you uh, lower the temperature of your reaction? Because in the first, uh, 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 I think the project you use a 200 to 240 degrees. Uh, but if let's say if you use a strain double bond and you can drive the reaction in forward uh, because the strain double bond can act as a better sacrificial uh, uh, acceptor uh, to release the strain, so which can add, which can lower the temperature. Have you thought about this? Yeah. Um, so norbornene, which is the first one I showed, is 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 somewhat strained, um, but there's a lot of different factors that affect this. So um, one thing, you, you form the iridium one species, and if the dehydrogenation of the alkane is, is rate determining, um, or somewhere along the line there's a rate determining step, then having this, this strained olefin uh, isn't going to help you. Secondly, more active olefins tend to bind to the iridium and, and take that out, out of cycle. Um, so usually the actual hydrogenation of the sacrificial olefin is not the rate determining step. So in general, that's not uh, not really going to drive things. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor. So let me close this discussion part. So please join me in thanking Professor Alan Goldman for his excellent talk. And we'll uh, move to the next speaker. Alan, could you stop sharing the next uh, person? Okay. Gets um, I can try. <laughs> uh, the same button. Yeah. Uh, I think you already did. Yeah. Oh, okay. That worked? Yeah, yeah, already, already. All right, great. <laughs> so, Narasimha Murthy, you can share this. Professor Kishnan has joined us. So, Professor Kishnan will conduct this uh, chair this session and this uh, second lecture. Or I'll continue. Unmute. Yeah. Yeah. There's a question. You are muted. Unmute. Yeah. Actually, maybe just let's continue. With... It's up, Mr. Kishnan. Yeah, he is muted. Why don't we just hmm. continue? Okay, then I'll continue. Our next speaker is uh, Professor N. Narsim Murthy. He is from IIT Madras. He is going to talk on ligand control structure, spectroscopy, and oxidation reactions of 3D metal complexes. He is one of the earlier students, first batch or second batch students of AGS. So let us hear from Narsim Murthy. Narsim Murthy, please. Thank you, FC. Screen is not there. Yeah, you can share the screen. Yes, yeah, yeah. I'm doing it. Okay. Do you see? Yeah. Yeah, you can see. You can uh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the, the chairman IPC department and uh, Professor uh, Tilagar for giving me an opportunity to, to share some of the work that uh, we have been doing at uh, IIT Madras. But before that, this is also an opportunity for me to thank uh, my former mentor, Professor Samuelson, who gave me an opportunity to learn copper chemistry in his lab. He gave, he gave me all the freedom to learn from the mistakes and then uh, to become an independent researcher. Also, you know, he really gave me a good foundation to really go and do my postdoctoral uh, research uh, in the US. He's also a very good uh, human being. Whenever I wanted uh, help, he was always there. And why I said he's a good human being? Because when I joined IIT Madras, after two years, I met with a major road accident in front of our IIT gate, and I, I don't know how he came to know, and he came to see me uh, to ask and find out how I was doing. That is very nice of him. Those things uh, normally, you know, don't happen these days. So thank you. And uh, with regard to the the chemistry that I've been doing. In IIT Madras, 
but i thought before that there are a lot of students uh, from uh, ags group i know only you know a few of them uh, vijay shree was there allegation and then uh, baru of course uh, is the and the, the other one was uh, abraham you know when i just left the lab he was just, you know, just joined and i thought you know every one of you may be curious to know that what i did in uh, ags lab i have few slides to share before i really talk about uh, the chemistry that i have been doing at it in dras well those days you know i'm talking about this chemistry about 35 years ago the first problem that ags gave me was uh, converting the the phenol to catechol using the cuprous chloride so basically copper and phenoxides you know can react with oxygen and they can hydroxylate you know aryl ring there is a lot of precedence in the literature because lot of uh, you know copper proteins and uh, enzymes and known to transport oxygen also and they can hydroxylate hydrocarbons both aromatic and uh, aliphatic as part of the biological function so this is the problem given to me and then uh, uh, you know we didn't have uh, much facility and of course you know all that experiment ex experience that i had i had only done a few msc experiments i had no research exposure even preparing to first pair of those things was not easy and it took some time and particularly making uh, you know cuprous uh, phenoxide which is a bright uh, can be yellow solid and all the time i used to get uh, you know very dirty uh, yellow indicating that it was not pure you know it also means that i did not know the technique but then 6 months uh, elapsed uh, you know somehow i could not uh, make this reaction work i am i am sure you know if i had used uh, some colorants of nitrogens and uh, other ligands probably something would have happened but all the time i ended up getting uh, you know only the the starting phenol and cuprous chlor uh, cupric chloride it was so frustrating i'm sure right now ags was not happy and somehow one day i was under tremendous pressure then i felt hey instead of oxygen if i use uh, carbon disulfide because copper one is soft and carbon disulfide has a uh, sulfur which is soft what will happen so i simply you know injected uh, the carbon disulfide to the what you see in the center the cuprous phenoxide then all of a sudden i see a very quick reaction uh, formation of a you know brown uh, a block solid which was the cuprous sulfide and then uh, a colorless uh, supernatant and then suddenly i went to the ags and uh, i told him uh, i shared this reaction and i said let us find out what's happening and then finally we found out this uh, ortho carbonate is uh, was uh, what was forming but it was not easy to you know really identify this ortho carbonate although the molecule looks very simple but the proton number was uh, you know we could not really figure out uh, of course we never anticipated such a kind, kind of compound can form and uh, those days you know ei or uh, esa mass uh, mass was not available so i remember ags sent this sample to somewhere in uk and uh, one of his friend uh, you know provided the uh, mass spectrum but then that also was not very clear we did not know what the structure was so finally i grew a crystal of this and our containing bromo at the para position was uh, very crystalline and uh, we you know i collected the data because i work with uh, uh, professor h manohar he was my co guide i learned crystallography and so i wanted to do the structure and uh, this compound uh, with the bromo uh, was the first crystal that i started collecting data but unfortunately i found out when this compound contains bromide the bromine at the para position or bromine anywhere was not very stable to x-ray so i had to use uh, about four crystals to uh, you know collect full data and then scaling was uh, you know not that easy uh, so finally we got the structure and we came to know this was the compound that formed and uh, you know later we found out it is just not only the solvent but co you know co ligands like you know triethylamine uh, bases uh, nitrogen bases or it could be uh, phosphorus containing uh, you know phosphines uh, gave different kinds of you know products and reactions as you can see here on the on the right side when you use the triethylamine uh, you know carbon disulfide stop the reaction at this stage where the thiamine is formed 
but when you use a trithenyl phosphine, then we could uh, stabilize this uh, the compound. And what was more interesting was this uh, this compound also looks very simple, and in the literature it was uh, you know not easy to make, and this was one of the simplest way to make this compound. And in addition, this has a lot of interesting properties. This conformation, what is called anomer anomeric effect, you know, particularly in carbohydrates, is very well known. And uh, those properties were studied in collaboration with uh, Professor J C. And uh, you know, I was very happy uh, to get uh, you know Jack's paper at that time. Well, later, instead of the carbon disulfide, if we use uh, you know thiocyanate, phenyl thiocyanate, what will happen? And we found uh, very interesting reactions. You know, if you if you use simple when R is a paramethyl group, we found that it forms an exonuclear complex, but uh, it needs uh, you know coligand like uh, phosphite. In the previous case, I showed you phosphine. Uh, otherwise, you know the reaction uh, don't go forward. You need to have a coligand. Uh, and this was uh, the, the right side was the one I just started before I left to the US, and then uh, I think later on, uh, you know, Abraham Santosh Abraham, you know, he did a detailed study, and uh, you know, they also determined the structure of this compound. Because this compound that uh, the exonuclear compound that you see on the left side uh, was uh, structure was determined by me, and uh, the one on the right side it was uh, you know, although I predicted before I left that probably this is the uh, Tetranuclear, but although I had no clue, uh, so that was the, the chemistry that I did uh, in AGS lab, and uh, that uh, the exonuclear complex complex that I showed you is what is called a paddle wheel that you can see on the uh, left hand side. Uh, you know, the top corner is a, this is a paddle wheel, and uh, you can see that uh, it has uh, got that six of them here. So this is a paddle wheel structure, and very interesting because. And also, this whole copper one complexes, and the one that you see was not determined by me, but it was determined by Santosh. Absolutely, so, the, the chemistry that you do uh, in IIT Madras is inspired by, you know, nature, metalloproteins and metalloenzymes. Uh, this is, uh, you know, what I'm showing you is heme protein, hemoglobin, myoglobin, and cytochrome P450. Uh, these are well studied and uh, well established uh, examples that are there in the in the textbook everywhere. But what is not uh, really not well understood and uh, lately people are uh, you know studying are the non-heme uh, metalloenzymes uh, and some of the things that I put uh, here in this slide is also you know there in the textbook. Uh, these metalloenzymes are responsible for many of the reactions, respiration, you know, activation of nitrogen synthesis of. Uh, uh, proteins are uh, cleavage of uh, the DNA, what is called uh, repair and uh, religation. All this is done by the you know metalloproteins and uh, metalloenzymes. And the one that I'm showing at the bottom is a uh, copper containing uh, you know enzyme is uh, what is called uh, tyrosinase and uh, hemocyanin is also known to transport oxygen. Uh, but not only tyrosinase transports oxygen, but also it does the hydroxylation of hydrocarbons. And the ones that I've shown on the right hand side is uh, you know non-heme containing uh, Ion proteins and uh, methane monoxygen is particularly known to do, you know, catalysis uh, converts the methane to methanol using uh, O2 as an oxidant. But you would ask me at the end that you are showing all this, how much have you done this? Uh, you know, maybe I, you know my answer to that is uh, not much, but these reactions have inspired and the reaction that we wanted to really do has given uh, you know, totally different uh, results and new results. So basically, you know, bioinorganic chemistry makes use of the, the ligands, and some of the ligands that I've put at the bottom are tridentate, tetradentate, or bidentate. Uh, particularly, the one that I'm showing you here is a, you know, tetradentate ligand is uh, well established, uh, used in, uh, you know, most of the chemistries that are uh, people are uh, uh, studying. And the one that I, you know, shown here is uh, not much explored. Similarly, what I've shown here is the, the top one, the symmetrical tridentate ligand, and the unsymmetrical tridentate ligand has not been used much. Uh, the one that uh, you know I've shown here, and that the other two ligands, bidentate ligands that I've shown here, contains a biphenyl append. So you know the simple uh, the bipyridine ligands are well known, and if you want to really 
uh, control the geometry and these are the kind of you know steric hindrance people have put on the ortho position of the ortho to the nitrogen and this is what gives rise to you know geometry control as well as reactivity but uh, you know making such ligands is not easy so what we found that simply by simple amino methyl pyridine the amine group you know you can attach the biphenyl group so this biphenyl group not only gives the steric hindrance but also controls and gets adjusted because of the biphenyl twist that i've shown uh, you know the, the twist is not shown here but it gets twisted and can get adjusted uh, from 35 to 45 degree it can get twisted and uh, allow different kinds of metal to the coordinate and that's something that you know we accidentally uh, found and the chemistry that uh, you know we have explored using uh, this ligand is what i'm going to show in the coming slide so this is the, the ligand that what i have shown here basically it contains a weak nitrogen donor uh, of course you know if one can have a tertiary butyl group but then the nitrogen becomes really very weak and it will not do the chemistry that you want to do but uh, we found this combination appears to be very interesting uh, the chemistry so it is sterically hindered but also electronically competitive also it is hemilabile because of the nitrogen is very weak it allows you know lot of catalytic uh, reactions to take place so that is what i mentioned this flexibility of the biphenyl ring which can vary from 35 to 45 degree depending on what kind of metal that we are using and uh, sometimes you know these kind of ligands are used also uh, to prepare you know ferric complexes so this is one of the first uh, you know uh, report that we uh, shown that uh, you know if you have that kind of ligand simple dihydroxo bridge complexes will uh, are formed and if you react that with uh, you know the diester of the phosphate which is a kind of a, a model compound that is used as a model for the dna cleavage uh, basically the phosphate uh, the paragonitro phenoxide gets cleaved and it forms the inorganic phosphate and uh, in our case we found that inorganic phosphate gets combined with another inorganic phosphate to give you what is called pyrophosphate and that pyrophosphate in the presence of the ligand combines with uh, six metals to give you know hexa nuclear complex and we have looked at you know so many other uh, important things about kinetics and uh, you know also the intermediate that forms the intermediate that forms is where the uh, this the phosphate tester is coordinated and uh, on the other side the hydroxo is present and we feel that the hydroxo which is a nucleophile is what is responsible for the cleavage of this reaction i have not shown uh, all of those here so this is a nice uh, you know the structure hexa nuclear uh, the complex structure uh, and its chemistry that what we have reported in uh, two of these reports and our work uh, you know was uh, really highlighted in uh, one of this coordination chemistry reviews well not only the chemistry that i showed but we found that once you have this you know the biphenyl group it can really control the coordination geometry and controlling coordination geometries are important and particularly if you can make complexes that are soluble in uh, you know readily soluble in uh, common solvents where the spectroscopy can be looked at and they can really arrive at whether it is a four coordinate uh, you know geometry or the five coordinate geometry or the six coordinate geometry but if you look at the literature the biphenyl containing compounds are not really you know soluble highly soluble in uh, different kinds of solvents often that you see in the literature the spectroscopy is you you know done by using the solid samples but here in this case that we found attaching this a simple biphenyl and just varying the the alkyl uh, the two methylene this contains two methylenes whereas uh, you know this contains one methylene so you can see that on the left right hand side containing one methylene stabilizes you know five coordinate geometry the one containing on the left side which is a two methylene stabilizes you know four coordinate geometry and if you see in the literature i already showed you that uh, this uh, you know highly substituted ortho substituted biphenyl uh, bipyridine compounds are what is used to stabilize uh, four coordinate geometry and uh, uh, i mentioned before that to make such uh, you know ligands are not easy whereas you know this ligands are you know very easily made in one step so that is you know one advantage of these ligands so not only they dictate the reactivity that i showed in the case of copper but also they control the coordinate geometry and this is what is the you know the tetrahedral and then uh, five coordinate geometry and those are the parameters that i mentioned bit angles you can see in this case the bit angle is uh, about 100 whereas on the one on the right hand you know right side is bit angle is uh, 79 which is uh, suitable for you know stabilizing five coordinate and uh, six to four coordinate geometry. and I, i showed you that uh, you know the u visible signatures 
really tells you whether you know, a compound is a, a four coordinate or a five coordinate and here is an example that you know we have measured in uh, um, dichloromethane and the one on the left side uh, shows a beautiful uh, you know four coordinate geometry characteristics whereas on the on the right side what you see is the five coordinate you know geometry characteristics so easily by machine we use the spectrum sometimes you can, you can identify whether what kind of you know geometry a particular complex has it so and similarly you now we have also used the nmr uh, which is paramagnetic camera nmr not routinely people practice this it is the, not easy to understand and not every molecule probably will uh, show such beautiful uh, you know kind of uh, uh, nmr and particularly in the case of uh, you know nickel in this in these examples we we arrived at uh, you know their structures and uh, also found out that uh, one is a four coordinate geometry the tetrahedral other one is a five coordinate schism by geometry so you know we also showed in the in the solution that you can basically titrate the nickel chloride with this ligand and uh, we you know you can see here basically it gives rise to five coordinate and not the the four coordinate so it's basically this bitangle which what dictates formation of the uh, five coordinate complex we have done the same thing with other metals in you know, the cobalt uh, and you can see very nice uh, spectroscopic features and uh, normally one sees uh, you know only three bands in the view visible spectrum but what you see is an additional three bands this is due to the you know, weak uh, weak field uh, metal complexes giving a spin arc coupling is what gives rise to this kind of an extra features which is not common in the in the literature so we have done you know all other metals iron uh, you know not only uh, cobalt and nickel what i showed you but also copper so clearly indicating that uh, it is the steric hindrance uh, and also the flexibility of ligand what uh, controls the, the geometry of uh, you know four coordinate and the five coordinate we have also done uh, you know self assembly of uh, iron oxo aggregates uh, only a small part of this what has been published and uh, Uh, we have not published the you know lot of the results that i've shown here that you can see that uh, the bidental ligand that what i showed you is uh, simply by using different kinds of carboxylic acids you can stabilize an you know diene complex or if you use a simple benzoic acid you can have you know hexanuclear complex or you can convert uh, you know one complex to the other that you can see here this you know binuclear to tetranuclear complex uh, such kinds of things uh, are talked about in biology of course in uh, you know many of the Uh, the in uh, inorganic chemistry reactions conversion from binuclear to dinuclear dinuclear to sorry tetranuclear and then hexanuclear and then you see here is a you know uh, this is a uh, 10 metals that are present um, in this example which is not very common so basically what it shows that is the you know simple ligand can do uh, wonders uh, unlike the you know the bidentate ligand that i showed you uh, you can have a tridentate ligand all that we have done is a, again have attached a biphenyl group and uh, here we find that it basically stabilizes unusual you know uh, structures containing uh, you know two metals binuclear com- you know ion centers are very common in biology similar uh, three you know varieties of uh, methane monoxide that i showed you uh, and you see here the you know there are unsymmetrical in the, in the nature and here also we notice Uh, the at the bottom that you see is an unsymmetrical uh, you know binuclear complex containing oxo as well as carboxylic situation these are the structures well sometimes uh, you know you don't need to have a design ligand uh, we found out if you have a, a simple tridentate ligand but uh, if it is not symmetrical unsymmetrical we found that uh, it gives isomerism also it gives the dynamics and I accidentally we found out that it oxidizes the the amine to imine one can call it dehydrogenation but it is not the you know dehydrogenation it is taking place it is a active you know cobalt to activates oxygen and converts the you know amine to imine is uh, what we have studied and on the other hand the symmetrical ligand that i showed here with okay. Sorry, something happened. Your screen seems to be gone. I I don't know. I 
there was a gray screen yeah. at the bottom. Maybe you clicked on that. Can you click on the white? Share and share again. Maybe. You share it again. Oh, I don't know what happened. Yes, no, it's okay. Ah, oh, okay. Ah, uh, you see everything fine? Yeah, you can wind it up. Nasimatte. Oh, okay, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll quickly do that. Does okay, not come you see what uh, what I shown here that you know they, they form uh, you know facial meridional uh, depending on uh, what kind of ligand that we are using. So let me go through you know this is the dynamics uh, that we have measured at room temperature. The spectrum is basically featureless. We do not see anything. But when we cool this down to minus 35, we see you know very nice uh, you know NMR spectrum. But it uh, shows that it is a mixture of uh, different isomers that are present at the same time. And uh, the, the converted amine uh, has a you know nice NMR. It is not as dynamic as the, the amine is what is shown here. And we have uh, you know uh, looked at the oxygen reactivity and then uh, measured the reactivity you know by the usable and NMR spectrum. We have shown that the, finally the product that is coming is uh, amine, both by the amine and the slide is not slide is not coming. Both the slide is not showing up. No, no, no. You have no, to share. No. You have to share the slide. You yeah. have to share it one more time. Yeah. Yeah. Share it again. I was sharing, but somehow you know something happened. Stop, Stop it and share again. Share it again. Okay, you know just this. Uh, or you can conclude it. Yes. Uh, okay. So basically. What we have done is, uh, you know, accidentally we found out that uh, you can really cleave the uh, the this methyl group, uh, which is uh, the anisole, what is called uh, demethylation of the the methyl group. Accidentally, we found, uh, you know, such kinds of reactions are done really using the noble metals. Of course, in uh, in biology, this happens, and we have shown, you know, basically we have looked at each and every. Uh, product that is formed indicating that uh, when you use a chloride it goes through this uh, a different mechanism and it requires a tertiary butyl hydroxide as an oxidant but if you use an iodide as a anion it goes through you know a peroxide compound and uh, this is the product that is formed indicating that uh, it, these two reactions are taking two different pathways but giving the same product uh, in the sense demethylation reaction so we have looked at the structure. We have followed them uh, by use of the spectrum, indicating uh, you know there is a uh, you know the there is a liability of the uh, anisole as well as the, the halides, and that is what is shown here through NMR spectroscopy that uh, such a kind of liability can be easily monitored by NMR. And uh, basically, electrochemistry has shown that in the case of fluoride, the redox potential is uh, very positive, whereas in the case of Iodo complex redox potential negative, clearly indicating that uh, the iodo complex is able to, you know, uh, activate oxygen and do the the chemistry. I think you can stop at this stage. Yeah, okay. you're not able to see the slide. Okay. You stop. So maybe saying. if you have any question, uh, let me make it open for discussion. Sure. Anybody is having one or two quick questions. Yeah. Uh, can I just uh, say something about this slide? Yeah, uh, nothing is it's not coming it's, slide it's is not visible visible so whatever you are oh, telling we are not able to understand much yeah. can you stop and share stop sharing and share it again yeah i am i am unable to understand it is it, it, it i i can see but i am not able to yeah, just, something yeah. wrong, i think yeah i think you are not able i you know for some reason is not allowing me to, you know, share. Just, just the exit and the upload. Okay. Still, it is not coming. Should I exit? I think you. There was a gray box at the right. Can you hear me? I we can hear you, but we are not able to you, see the slides. Can, I think it is good to just exit That's and come yeah, back. That yeah, might exit be. and come back. So Sai says he can see the slide. Maybe it will come to us. <laughs> it doesn't come here though. Yeah, I, I don't see it yet. Yeah, I don't see it either. 
Sai can share his screen. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know what happened. So, uh, that, you know, ஒருத்தர்ஸ்டர்ஸ்டர்ஸ்டர்ஸ்டர்ஸ்டர்ஸ்டர்ஸ்டர்ஸ்டர்ஸ்டர்ஸ்டர்ஸ்டர்ஸ
one of the thing is that please be in, be say that you are inorganic chemist. Still, I remember I would say that I am an inorganic chemist. So, uh, and Professor Kilzen uh, uh, Sakrabarty has been a, like a guide in my throughout my life, and he has been you know we were probably you know not missing a cup of tea at eleven o'clock, and he was I I don't know what was the reason of choosing me and taking me to the uh, to the tea uh, tea shops okay the, during that time and giving me such an opportunity to to interact with such a person okay and I'm really grateful and motivated and guided by them the sky is you know sky is like this so 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 blue you know the flowers are there and you know you have to dream so you know i became a dreamer but you know i have not become an executor so still i keep dreaming and i'll be giving some of the things okay during my journey what what has what has been i have been able to carry out with my limited okay knowledge and limited abil abilities so the motivation to develop metal promoted or catalyzed reactions and to study novel organic inorganic materials even the greeneries aspires to reach the sky this is the this is the message i will send it to professor Samuelson. thank you sir because you know this all okay started in your laboratory and my aim in life was to become a university teacher beyond that i was not thinking that i'll become a researcher when i was as a student i was a student but after reaching your place I thought that okay, science can be taken up, and I'll be able to do science because I was not thinking, imagining that okay, I'll become a science, working with science. But I thought that okay, being a good teacher and being a being a university teacher, that is the highest positions which I can aspire. At that time, you know, when I was a student, I wrote a wrote a particular essay which also had the same implications, which was written by one of the warden of the host, hostel, saying that you fulfilled your dream. I was happy. My mother was. Mother was also so happy, and I felt happy because I see also she's no no more in the world, and I remember on this occasion again my mother because of certain reasons. Okay, despite of uh, which, okay, I could really stand up to the occasion. So now, if I say scientific, why, why fundamental? Uh, it is because it is fundamental. It provides new economical viable, viable selective and specific reactions. It has extended realms and catalyzes polymers, biological studies, drugs, materials, nanodimension, many things. And we can go on talking about thematic aspects of the presentation. So if we look at the look at the uh, look at these transparencies, ligand reactivity, in situ transformation, catalytic activity, and so on. Now the I on the personal side, I was introduced to the subject during PhD by Professor A. G. Simonson, where I studied copper promoted allylic nucleophilic substitution. What is interesting to that is that really today also allylic activation subject has been continuing with large scopes. This is after 30, 30 years. Still, it is as the same active state. That means okay, what a what a area where he wanted to start and where he where he has been continuing and what he's been doing at the fundamental things at uh, with the points okay to be you know, that uh, that point is to be noted and and that points to be realized by any of the scientists okay who will be doing science um, science okay in the fundamental sites so having inspired by this okay i go to go to the next transparency i just say that okay i have susan certain molecules okay quinolines Okay, the quinoline Susan because we're in these particular studies and, and then quinoline derivatives and there are other things also which I have included, but this quinoline will be the prime thing. So I just said that these are, you know, very relevant as the present day also. We need good health, okay, good health and for good health, okay, these can these compounds are being serving as medicines in many, many purposes. Now, looking at that again, you know, your first point about quinoline will come that, okay, it forms in, it forms prevents aggregation in the aggregation by you know which is very very important in of the homogen and that is very important at the present context again and you know it forms many interesting complexes metal complexes which are useful for metal recognition molecular recognition you can talk in terms of dimension they can you can bring nano or you can take you know any other dimension if you say that you know that would be that is interesting and then you know they are useful in in medical site again okay in sensing mri okay all these aspects are well known 
so if you talk about reactivity quinoneal you know i am just giving you one example metal mediated reactions okay are very much essential okay and uh, quinoline has the provision and quinoline provides the ways to do many of the reactions at different positions okay and there are a lot of publications okay in, if you look at organic chemistry journal you will see that all the time in, in terms of ch activation on the outer position at the meta position at our here it will be not or to meta one two three four positions okay you can go on substituting and you can there are publications after publications going on with the leveling experiments mechanism variations and many other things now coming to our my my point okay so we started with a simple reactions okay where we thought of making you know simple substitution reactions in presence of sodium hydroxide but we ended up in metal complexes and then you know we, we isolated the 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 sodium complex here and the sodium complex which was isolated and it is a one dimensional coordination polymer then this coordination polymer can you know can be can be you know, can be reacted with different and different substrates and you can generate different kind of coordination polymers and you know the first texture was difficult and we had to take help of us uh, of the stake from germany and he has been kind enough to help us in the initial stage because it took 2012 okay my crystal of background was quite weak now see if we go to the i am just showing the next reactions okay where a simple reactions okay which we tried actually we we thought that okay can we cycle uh, can we think of making you know ch activation ch activation process and we thought that okay we'll choose some metal and try to do, try we uh, do some reaction with first attention metal we started with simple metal salts and found that found that you know cyclization takes place in cyclization taking place giving a salt and we have stuck we structurally determined this and we thought that okay these are interesting and uh, we are interesting in fluorescence properties and you know we they, we may prepare series of uh, halide halide salts and we, we then we, uh, we did the you know stickislavski studies and published beyond this it's the same reactions when you take a substituent if we take a methyl group instead of instead of the proton you can see that okay the methyl group okay next to the bromide you get in you know, cyclic product and as well as open esters and you get you know three types of compounds actually three one is the solvent at re reacting another one is without solvent cyclizing and another one is just this ester hydrolysis now see depending on this reaction was very much in interesting because it was metal dependent and it was it was in case of you know copper you get first compound 100 only one first compound if you take you know if you take copper uh, if you take uh, take um, ethyl group um, that means ethanol okay um, um, r equal to ethyl group you get you know a cyclic compound in case of copper whereas if you use okay ethyl group or methyl group and you take nickel compound you get the third compound that means you know you not get the solvent attacking the attacking the substrate we have done done the we have carried out the reaction procedure by taking taking deuterated solvent and you know we try to probe okay how it has happened and the cyclic cyclic part which is shown below is the you know is the one okay which is which is uh, uh, which is being you know Uh, which is um, which establishes the process reaction process a cationic in cationic species is involved and then you know if you look at if you look at the um, look at the substrate which is shown in the lower bottom of the right side okay you can uh, right side you can see that okay the 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 compound doesn't have appropriate geometry doesn't cyclize in presence of copper and nickel so this is one of the aspect and second thing okay, we have done a okay, catalytic catalytic alcohol alcoholic reaction of hydroxy quinoline derivatives which is the, which was actually we want intended to prepare manganese complex as model complex and do the you know then do redox reactions and you know radical reactions and try to make cc bond formation and then do elimination all these things we were thinking but you know what happened is that we got simply simply substitution reaction uh, solvolysis reactions in presence of air and if the absence in absence so here this reaction was not catalytic and then we found that manganese three complex is formed this manganese three complex is uh, okay then you know we take took the manganese three complex itself and did, did the reactions we find that it catalyzes and then we have chosen a stellar stone derivative of the manganese three and found that okay same reaction can be catalyzed by that if you look at this reaction itself see if you if we if this hydrolysis reaction takes place itself first thing is that it is a um, promoted reaction in the I mean, initial stage you you need three 
three units to come to the manganese and means to get three hydroxyquinolinate unit coming to the manganese first then you know the three units are converted and hydrolyzed and or or esterified and then you know rest of the things is taken by the they get done by the manganese three complex which is in formed formed in situ this can be seen through the through the ev spectroscopy that means at the initial stage okay you know, uh, or rather at the nearer nearer region you can see the and you see the you know particular kind of reaction because the change in the concentration of the manganese complexes okay, can be monitored through through spectroscopic means or we can do through gc then where we can see the initiation process and then followed by the followed by the pickup of the reaction so now the as, the as far as the mechanism is concerned okay i put it here but you know the uh, time is set away. i don't think that i should you know to uh, take too much time to go have uh, uh, to discuss about these things okay further i'll move to the next transparency the next transparency is on a on the reversible copper zinc by binding with aminoquinoline uh, amino compounds the reason is that okay or quinoline compounds the reason is that in biology zinc and copper they bind to uh, bind to a substrate but you know if the zinc is kept, kept intact and uh, zinc can be you know easily removed by copper but whereas the copper cannot be removed by zinc so it is a challenge to you know make reversible systems in any any receptors where zinc and zinc and zinc and copper will reversibly bind the first process is very easy that means zinc binding and then copper re copper reacting with the substrate or the zinc complex to replace the zinc uh, replace the zinc is easy but you know a copper complex when it is bound zinc will not zinc doesn't do that easily so there there are, there are some attempts which are being made in these particular things. I am giving you two examples in front of you, which are which are on the quinoline amino quinoline derivative, and you can you can see that okay, you can see that okay, this particular process. I don't know why why somebody. Okay, it got halted. Can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you, but there seems to be some. Somebody says that the, somebody has taken control of other things. <laughs> somebody is actually somebody is controlling that. Okay, I again have shared uh, this thing. You start I sharing. Shared. Someone clicked on a button by mistake. Yeah, uh, I, they said that okay, it is controlled by somebody now. Uh, okay, I'll a, share again. Okay, I am sharing again. I am doing again. Because the outside organization, I think it. Uh, yeah, somebody, somebody no, said that they have taken control over your system and. There is a button to take control, but I don't know. Yeah. Someone accidentally pressed it. <clears throat> okay, it's coming again. I'll move it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, we can see it. I can go. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we have designed a ligand. Okay, where uh, a three coordinate, uh, three three amino quinoline, uh, two amino quinoline, and one quinoline containing ligand, which can reversibly, which which has the which which can you know form complex. Okay, and we our interest has been to say, again to again uh, means sense this zinc and copper that was one of the thing also there so what we have done is that we took a took a uh, synthetic a synthetic process where we have um, taken a bisphenol of the quinoline initially then you know we functionalize and then with the amino quinol ester 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 amino quinol ester okay um, bromo ester compound okay and then we find that we find we could prepare this ligand now what we have done is that we have taken we have just thought that if the r groups okay if are seen that means okay there will be a, there will be steric region which is going to guide the uh, guide the uh, uh, guide the particular process. We felt that this is a good work, but you know, finally we landed up in publishing in Inuini Chemical Actor because you know one of the comp complex was showing the high R factor. Okay, where you know always we were getting rejection that time, and I was not smart also enough to you know write properly properly to get it published. But I feel that this is quite interesting work. And then what is what was there is that see, the, the there are two 
Ligan, okay, which are being shown, okay, whose state taxes is being shown that you can see that because of methyl groups, you, the orientations are different in this case, and the properties are clearly different, different, different in these two cases. Okay, if you look at the emission properties, okay, in the in the, in the case of uh, in the case of this ligand, where unsubstituted thing is there, if you add zinc, it is very interesting. First thing that see, it has a 397 nanometer. Nonometer peak, uh, nonometer uh, uh, at nonometer uh, um, absorption in, in, in the parent compound has, and that will change this. That will go to the get to go to 493 nanometer. Finally, it will go up, and then you know it splits up into dual emission. So that means uh, from single emission, it splits up to the dual emission. Whereas in case of copper, it it just gets quenched. Okay, on that is on the right right side. So this particular process is. Process is explained with TICT, which I'm not explaining because, again, you know, I'll say that okay, this is because of the time. But you know, if you take the simply methyl, simple methyl substitution, you can see that you will be able to see the changes, okay, changes in the means okay, reversible binding, which you, we are expecting. And this is this is what happens, and reversibility can be done at least at least three times. We have checked, we can what we can do is that we can add sequentially copper. Um, copper and zinc, or zinc or copper, both will do the same purpose. That is just the zinc and zinc in copper, or first you add zinc or copper, then in zinc, it will do the you know reversible process, and you can do the reversible binding in this particular compound. And this is attributed to the to the uh, to the steric factors of the methyl group, which makes it uh, makes the makes the binding so that it is uh, it is compatible, so uh, compatible to form or have a, you know comparable uh, comparable binding constant with uh, of each other. And we have done <laughs> extensive solution studies, okay, NMI studies, and then then um, um, uh, then calorimetric studies also through calorimetric titrations and then you know um, ICT and and we found that okay it is in fact true. Now I, I I'll skip this again because this is just the NMI spectra of the compound. Okay, we how we have done. Okay, how the titrations are being carried out. Now moving to the next compound. Okay, which where I'm just showing you the electronic effect of electronic effect causing the cyclization process. If you have the acyl methoxy compound and if you have the have the uh, have the uh, have the nitro derivatives. Okay, you can see that. Okay, you can see uh, see that. Okay, you, you you have heterocyclic compound formation in these particular cases and and this uh, the reaction is done by in the done uh, reaction is catalyzed by the copper simple copper acetate and and we can prepare copper and we, we have what we have done is that we have prepared series of copper complexes and copper zinc complexes and then uh, uh, not zinc complex nickel complexes which are four coordinated and they, they have C source structures and then we have been a week after characterization we have been able to look at the catalytic reactions and in presence of the oxygen okay ideal okay, uh, air this particular okay this is the mechanism which we put forward and this is being established to ESS spectroscopy as well as by doing you know, uh, doing uh, control experiments and to um, to explain the catalytic process. Now, having uh, having shown this, okay, we uh, as I said that okay, we have prepared series of compounds and depending on the solvents, okay, we get different different types of complexes which we have characterized and then after character uh, after characterizing uh, characterizations, they got very interesting. We got very interesting sea source taxes, okay, which are which are presented and you can find it uh, in this particular particular paper and article and and that that has you know structural may uh, more structural interest than the reactive interest because the reactions what is susan has not 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 only you know has some uh, in, in interest from the in, uh, electron um, with the electron uh, withdrawing group as well as electron donating group, but in cyclization process, but also has the interest, uh, has the, you know, already reported that without the catalyst also the reaction can proceed. So, you know, the, the, uh, and the reaction, uh, those reactions, okay, which are being described are, are actually nominal changes in terms of, in terms of catalyst, catalysis, I would say that, and uh, means um, the uh, activation barrier, which is brought down is nominal. So I, uh, we feel that, okay, the catalytic part is lesser, lesser important than the than the in this particular reaction than the you know the structural studies. 
Now having this again, I move to another composite of compound where I show some some uh, simple reaction of a simple reaction of the uh, of the uh, of a carboxylic acid which is a CHO group. Okay, our interest is that to functionalize the CHO group and then and um, the, then prepare carboxylate complex of the various metal to metals and then functionalize CHO group to anchor anchor fluorophoric site or to anchor to polymers or to anchor anchor to any other substrate. Okay, we should generate interesting material properties now while doing that okay we just you know overcome this uh, this request reaction sequence which is which is unusual you can see that uh, see that okay the first reaction is not uh, not very uh, not no, first reaction which is shown okay on the top okay, on top okay sorry uh, top results the inclusion compound okay of the uh, inclusion or compound of the oxime okay so that is not very that is uh, that is nothing but you know for the uh, hydroxylamine hydrochloride has formed the oxime and then you know it could just form it form that inclusion compound. Then after having that, if you take excess of you know Barua, this reaction, Barua, you take the dependence. Yes, please. Barua, I, the, the slide is blank. Uh, I don't know if others are also seeing only some text uh, without any structures. We are okay. seeing the slide. We can blank. see. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Okay. So yeah. I think there is some technical issues, okay, which are coming up. But now at the yeah. moment, I I can see it fully, okay, and somebody else can could see it. Thank you so much, that okay for pointing out. Okay, so what we have is that now, okay, we have the we have the aldehyde, okay, which is now okay, which is now which uh, which forms oxime, and then you know we okay that is uh, that is conventional, and then in addition to oxime complex, we get as an interesting CH, uh, uh, interesting complex, okay, which is formed through aldehyde act uh, activation, and then you know it is uh, it uh, the complex is shown at the left side, left side, okay, and well, that is that is an unusual complex we should get, you know, you can, we we uh, we um, we explain it. Uh, we can explain it through a CS activation process or process to form that particular complex. And that means the simple ex oxime oxime formation reactions is module is uh, is modulated in presence of the simple um, by using copper to acetate in, and the reaction is highly stoichiometric dependent. And you we get different product and we can get we can prepare oxime included compound. And this oxime included compound, if if we look at see this is a chloro. This is a bi. Uh, this is a one ten phenantonin complex, which can which can um, which provides the interesting geometry in the packing to make it make it distinct. I'm not putting the packing diagram here because the conference is towards organic towards um, it was initially suggested to, him, to me as a catalytic catalytic reaction. So I felt that okay, I was put me prepared that I have prepared the transparencies according to the size of the so uh, according to the topic of the conference. So. I move to the next, the next, uh, next uh, transparency is where we show that the electronic effect of the central metal atom can also generate, you know, generate interest in, in you know, uh, the, the intrinsic acidity of the, uh, of the, um, or intrinsic acidity of the OH functional group. And this is this is being shown. This is being reflected in the in the fluoride sensing. Okay, because the fluoride can you know can remove the uh, the phenolic OH and in, it can generate a delocalized structure. And then we use this. We prepare the series of oxime complexes where OH groups OH groups are being present. In the phenolic OH groups are present, and these phenolic OH groups can be replaced or being sensed by fluoride ions. And uh, and you know what happens is that copper and zinc makes a difference. Copper, zinc, and nickel makes a difference in the if we Visible spectra, okay. In changing the position, uh, that means the wavelength, okay, where it is, where it is going to show the, show the, um, show the um, means new peak is going to be dependent on the central, central, uh, central metal ion and the detection. That means can be changed by um, by varying the central metal ion in these particular cases. So we have may we um, the mechanism of can the, you summarize, uh, yeah, yeah, can you yeah, summarize I'll summarize, that, uh, I'll, I'll summarize okay. So we have this. Then you know, I'll just show you. This is the last transparency. I'm showing you a com compound. Okay, where you have, you know, you have the nitrogen. Uh, you have the a simple nitrogen cheap base complex, cheap base ligand. Okay, now depending on the metal ion, you have different types of complex. You can, uh, you can generate CN bond. Okay, you can generate uh, means. Okay, you can you use the acidity of the things, and you can uh, you you make the simple metal complex of the ligand itself. That means you can see in nickel, it is the simple metal complex in copper. Well, it is a deprotonated species in manganese. It is a CN bonded formation form a reaction. That means okay, you have varieties in reactions. Okay, these are 
and and you. actually to summarize okay depending on the metal ion metal ion in consideration the cyclization part and also the course of certain reactions were changed steric effects is demonstrated as the course as the cause for a selective reversible binding of copper and zinc ion to quinoline based receptors aryl oxidation was used to develop copper and catalyze cyclization reactions to prepare heterocycles electronic effects of the reaction influencing pro metal promoted reactions and the role of d electronic configuration of metal ion in changing is demo, uh, demonstrated and metal uh, in the metal dependent reactivity of copper promoted reaction of an oxam is demonstrated the versatility is so large that we can go on extending things and we can go on we go on uh, suggesting reactions by switching switching one of the substrate because this most of the reactions are substrate dependent we have to identify substrate then make a series of compound then we can say that okay we have done a particular study so that the science will continue in this particular direction by getting one reaction specific reactions with a particular substrate and that so switching the substrate and diversifying the things you can see lot of papers public getting published in joc and organic organic letters of this means of so such kind of reaction. Activities. Finally, coming to this uh, transparency, I made for especially to Professor De Samuelson to tell you, through because you know photography has been my present, you know my one of my choice now. Okay, through my mobile. This is nothing beyond my mobile. Okay, I take the, these photographs and I just say, what I have learned from Professor Samuelson is dig out scientific essences. Thank you for motivating us. Okay, I would say that how to dig out scientific essences. We have, we have been we have learned from you. Aspire. you aspire to use scientific platforms okay you have aspired us that you have we have a big platform on the sunflower which i have shown you you have aspired and to script things okay so that i make is history or you know leave to the leave as a mark to the um, uh, mankind and overcome uncertainty to take up challenges that we it is a challenge so i put two things okay i i bow down in front of you i put my head down and not only to you to professor krishnan as well as to professor a s akurti because of i am little emotional at the moment i am just saying with my heart i feel proud to be seated with you thank you professor guru how are you doing the part questions maybe one question yeah because it would be very difficult for me to say that i am retained okay yeah only one question i'll allow because yeah. time is up here yeah. you, you said uh, you know zinc uh, you know copper binds tightly but not uh, zinc and that is yeah. expected so i am unable to understand see the zinc okay zinc binding zinc actually see so in many of the complexes okay see it depends actually okay i am talking about the quinoline derivative in the binding of the zinc is you know higher than the you know uh, no, sorry lower than the you know copper copper will tightly bind and you know it will form a stable complex and so once it once it forms a stable complex it is going to be difficult by by zinc to replace whereas the zinc complex is forms which is not going to be very stable but you know the copper will come and the ship and once the reversibility will be lost okay that means copper binding first will not be you will not will not be able to be replaced by zinc and zinc binding first will be able to replace by zinc uh, copper that is there in literature there are, there are lot of examples where in presence of that means okay in presence of zinc copper means copper can detect copper can be detected but in presence of copper zinc cannot be detected why because copper masks the effect so that is the thing, point i am trying to say in biology also it is the same thing see you have see higher amount of copper higher amount of zinc both are going to cause they will cause diseases and now if we can really control by this <laughs> by modulating this then you know we can effectively maintain the concentration of copper and zinc at that particular place okay thank you gorwa i think yes. we'll close this now please join me in thanking all the speakers of this session and i would also like to thank professor arunan and professor tilaga for giving me the opportunity to chair this session now okay, let us break you. for some I coffee or tea and virtual and coffee tea i suggest all of you go up on the chat box and click on the gather town i can log out right for sure yeah yeah you can yes, log I, out. i'm logging out i'll log in yeah, in after come join gather town yeah. now for 10 minutes and join back in the second session there is a separate okay. link for the second session click yeah. on that okay thank you Gather Town password is given just below the link in the chat box. 
please join there. We can just test it out now. The audio and video cannot be used in both, so we have to stop this when we join the gather town. Krishnan, can you hear me? I cannot sign out of this session because we use a different meeting for the second session. Krishnan, can you hear me now?